Uh, we shall start. Uh, it's on time right now. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, on behalf of the ID Society, I want to welcome you all to the uh, seventh lecture of the ID Society Distinct Speaker Series. And um, the ID Society has been an active an organization with a wide range of projects and activities contributing to the ethnic community in general and the University of Georgia in particular. Through our projects and activities, we strive to mobilize the wealth of intellectual capital in our community to promote the intellectual dialogue and educational advancement. Some of our major events include the Distinguished Speaker Series, Annual Friendship and Dialogue Dinner, Idea Award Ceremony, Turkey Trips, and Art NSA Contest, which is in promotional research and educational activities in the Athens Clark County and Oconee County Public Schools. The annual friendship and dialogue dinners are well attended by distinguished members of our community, including UJ administrators and faculty members, government officials and businessmen. I encourage you all uh, to visit our website for more information on the ID Society. Since this talk is being recorded, you can also visit and like our Facebook page to listen to, to this talk, as well as to get updates for announcements and upcoming events. Please fill out the sign-up sheet to hear more our current projects and upcoming, upcoming events. We are honored and proud to have Dr. Ori Soltas with us today to talk about making peace in and with the world the role of social movements. Dr. Soltes is a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University and currently teaches philosophy, theology, and art history. He has also taught across diverse disciplines for many years at the John Hopkins University, Cleveland State University, Case Western Reserve University, Siegel uh, College in Cleveland, and other colleges and universities. He has spent a lifetime wrestling with questions that resonate through the history of, of the human experience. His dynamic teaching, lecturing, curating, and writing reflect a broad series of interests and unique ability to combine them in, in unusual ways that are thought-provoking and both challenging and intellectually exciting. He has been interviewed for a score of programs on archaeological, religious, art, literary, and historical topics on CNN, the History Channel, and Discovery Channels. For seven years, Dr. Soltas was director of director and chief curator Binayi Brit Kwasnik, if I mispronounce it, please forgive me, National Jewish Museum, where he created over 80 exhibitions focus, focusing on aspects of history, ethnography, and contemporary art. As director of the National Jewish Museum, he co-founded the Holocaust Art, Art Restitution Project and has spent 10 years researching and consulting on the issue of Nazi plundered art. Dr. Soltes has over 200 publications, books, articles, catalog essays, inclu including 8,000 years of Georgian art, fixing the word Jewish American painters in the 20th century our sacred signs, how Jewish, Christian, and Muslim art draw from the same source. Also, this event is a blue card event. So for students uh, who are coming here for blue card, please, uh, you can see uh, our friend Atakan uh, just to, to do the uh, paperwork. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Orisoltas. Thank you. Don't confuse a blue card event with a blue plate special, because <laughs> almost none of you is old enough. If the time is right, but you're all too young to enjoy that. Does anyone even know what I mean by the blue plate special? Yes, you see. <laughs> it's, there are some restaurants in some cities where senior citizens, if they come and get an early dinner, they get a blue plate special. It's a special price because they want to get the income on the early side before the real people come in on the later side. <laughs> Um, I understand that my topic is making peace in and with the world, the role of social movements, and I'm going to cheat a little bit on that. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about one social movement, not many social movements, um, but I will certainly talk about making peace in and with the world. And 
I would begin actually by referencing um, Aristotle, whom some of you have probably read. And if you have read his politics, then you know that Aristotle defines the human being as an animal that habitually likes to live in a community, in a society. The Greek word is polis, but really we can translate that as a community. So a social movement is a movement which has as its point and its purpose to benefit a community, to benefit a society. And the question, of course, becomes how wide or how narrow you construe the society or the community to be in which you're interested in having an influence. And Aristotle is, of course, mainly thinking of the Hellenic world. In fact, he is most particularly thinking about a different Athens, not the one in Georgia, but the one in Greece, as a kind of central location for a particular type of polis, a particular type of community. Um, it's the kind of community in which um, about 170 years or so before his heyday, the term democracy was first coined, albeit with a narrower sense than we have come to apply to it as we think of democracy in the American context. The word peace, of course, is a word that is a derivative not from Greek but from Latin. Um, and the word that it comes from, you're also probably familiar with, Pax, P-A-X. And what it meant, as the Romans used, it was an absence of war. But when we're talking about making peace in and with the world, we don't mean just the absence of war. We mean a sense of fullness, not emptiness, which is conveyed more effectively by words, for example, like the Hebrew word shalom or the Arabic word salam. Those have an underlying nuance of fullness, of something positive and not simply the absence of the negative that we call war. So if one talks about making peace in and with the world with respect to a particular social movement, there are movements that have as their intention, their point and purpose to improve the community, however narrowly or broadly conceived, that have as their motivations different kind of underpinning ideas. So the ideas could be the kind of ideas that a John Henry Thoreau, a John Henry, John Henry David Thoreau um, enunciates, which are ideas that are impelled entirely by his sense of the human community and how it should function without any kind of reference to a metaphysical superstructure, without any kind of reference to what you and I might call divinity. On the other hand, there have been and there are currently any number of social movements, the underlying motivation of which to create a greater peace in the full sense and not the sense just of the absence of war in the world, are motivated by religious considerations. And the movement that I would speak with you about this afternoon is a movement, the, Hebrew, the uh, Turkish word hizmet means service. It's the hizmet movement. And it's a movement that is an uh, explicitly social movement, and it is a social movement which is explicitly under girded by certain spiritual concerns. Let me restart then with spirituality, with the idea of religion, spirituality, and in particular mysticism. Religion is that which, by definition, across the, across the panoply of different kinds of cultures and civilizations, seeks to bind us back to what we humans, whether it's in here or because it's out there, have believed across our history to have created us, to have created us with some purpose, and to have the potential to help us or to harm us, to curse us or to bless us. The word religion comes from Latin. The root L vowel G means a binding. And the prefix re means back or again. So religio in Latin is what binds us back to that source. And there is, of course, over the course, over the course of human history and across human geography, a range of different kinds of religiones, so different kinds of religions, each of which conceives of divinity in a particularized manner, but all of which have in common with each other the sensibility that there is such a thing as divinity and the notion that it has something to do with what we are or what we should be and that <clears throat> it is in our best interests 
to survive in the fullest positive sense of that term. That means not just not to die. It means to live in the fullest sense, that our interests are best served if we are connected back to that source in some way, shape, or form. Within religion, which of course comes in different varieties, so the Greeks and the Romans, whom I began by talking about, think of divinity in terms of a range of different gods and goddesses. And that range proliferates over the course of time so that by the time you get to the late Roman period, there are scores of different kinds of god and goddess concepts that represent different traditions from throughout this vast imperium, the Roman Empire. And in turn, all of those gods and goddesses in varying degrees are presumed to have powers that are greater than ours, but, more, but ultimately limited. The ultimate power is fate, which is disconnected from us, distant from us, that decrees ultimately, in the most fundamental sense, what happens to us, and which even the gods cannot argue against. How many of you have read the Iliad? Come on, show of hands. Book 16, one of the uh, allies of the Trojans, Troy, which is located on the northwest coast of what is now Turkey, one of the allies, a Lycian ally by the name of Sarpedon, is about to go down before the sword and spear of Patroclus, the best friend of Achilles, the Achaean star, who is si sitting out the football game and has handed his helmet and his uh, uniform to Patroclus. And Zeus would like to save Sarpedon's life because Sarpedon is one of the sons of Zeus by a mortal woman. So he's got some immortal blood within him, but ultimately the mortal will trump the immortal. And Hera, the queen of the Olympians, says to him, look, you know, you can do that. You are Zeus after all. But even you cannot predict how you might change the order of things if you obstruct the intentions of fate, of Moira, of destiny, and his destiny is to go down before the sword of Patroclus. And so you really shouldn't interfere, even though you could interfere. And Zeus has to step back. That's one sense of divinity. Along come the Abrahamic traditions and eventually develop a concept of a God that is both singular and all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good and all-merciful and thereby hang all kinds of questions that the Greeks would not have had, such as why the innocent suffer or why those who are not innocent seem to get off okay in a world that is governed by such a God. And the answer to that question is that there's no easy answer. And there may be no answer at all. Because by definition, God is other than what we are, even as God created us and therefore there must be something of God within us. And in that sense, there's a bit of us that is like God, and therefore there's a way in which God is like us. So it's a paradox. God is completely other than what we are, and yet in some sense like us. Well, in the mystical traditions, in the Abrahamic, among the Abrahamic faiths, that sensibility is even more intensely a focus of thought. The term mysticism comes from another Greek word, mysterion. Mysterion means that which is hidden. It comes from a Greek verb, mystein, which means to close or by extension to hide. So the mysterion is the hiddenmost recess of God. And the mystic believes, the mystic believes two things. One, that there is such a hiddenmost recess by paradox, by paradox, of a God that if it is singular without breakability, yet is perceived by the mystic as having a deeper recess and a kind of, as it were, outer shell. And that's all that garden variety everyday religion gets to, the outermost shell. It doesn't get to the deep recess. So I pray every day, or I pray three times a day, or I pray five times a day, it doesn't matter how many times. My prayers become rote. I pray with the congregation, but I'm not really thinking about what it is that I'm saying. And the connection, the access, is to God's outer edges, as it were. The mystic believes that there is an innermost recess, it's hidden, that takes a different kind of effort, a different kind of energy, a different kind of intention, a different kind of desire in order to access. I said there were two things the mystic believes. The other is, paradoxically, 
that that access is accessible, that that innermost, hiddenmost recess is accessible on the one hand, but on the other hand, of course, by definition, it's impossible to access, isn't it? It is that which is most other than what we are, the hiddenmost, innermost recess of God. So we can't get to it, and yet we can get to it. I can, I can't. I shall, I shan't. I can make the effort and get there. I can make the effort and still not get there. So one of the things you don't want to do is try to become a mystic if you're not comfortable with intense paradoxes and contradictions, because it will blow your mind. You'll go crazy. And in fact, each of these traditions recognizes both the challenges and the dangers of the mystical enterprise. Can I do what is necessary to get there, to make contact with that mysterion, that hiddenmost recess of God? And if I do, can I come back from that experience? And if I do that, do I have any way of expressing what it is that I've just had as an experience to share it with the community? What is the first prerequisite of the mystical enterprise? It is to empty myself of myself because the apparent goal, apparent goal of the mystical enterprise is to be filled with God. And I can't be filled with God unless I empty myself of self. If I empty myself of self in order to get there, can I get self back? Because if I don't get myself back, where am I? I'm dead. I'm crazy. I've apostatized. And if I can't get back and I can't communicate it, what value is it to the community? And if a prerequisite of my accessing the mysterion is to empty myself of self, then ultimately my goal has to be not to benefit myself, not to seek enlightenment for myself, because you hear self, self, self every time I say it. It's selfish. It's rather to have that experience so that I can come back from it and improve the world, improve the society, the community, the congregation of which I am part. That's got to be my goal. If my goal is personal enlightenment, then by definition it won't work because that's too self-centered. It's got to be selfless. But the danger and the paradox and the problematic is, assuming I can empty myself of self, can I get self back? And if I can't get self back, not only have I lost it for myself because I'm now dead or crazy or I've apostatized, but I ultimately cannot benefit the community of which I was part, which was my intention and my purpose in the first place. This kind of thinking should lead, and not surprisingly often does, to an array of different kinds of mystical thinkers that very different from what I keep referring to as the garden variety everyday religious leaders over the course of human history, who so often are interwoven in their spiritual thinking with political thinking, whose political spiritual thinking is informed by their own egos and their own sense of my way is the only way to understand God, and if yours is not mine, then at the very least I will oppress you, at the very worst I will kill you, or somewhere in between oppression and kill. Take your choice of which particulars you want. Find your place in history, find your place in human geography, and you'll see one example or more of this or the other. That the same mainstream leadership which is uncomfortable with the mystical process, because each individual, as it were, seeks that access in a fundamental way alone, not as part of the community, even as the goal of that individual is to come back and benefit the community. Each individual is in danger of death or apostasy or madness, and if everybody in the community is doing it, then everybody is going to die or go mad or apostatize. And by the way, I'm out of a job if as mystics you no longer need my sacerdotal advice to help you understand how to access God. But for the mystic, who must be devoid of ego in order to even engage in the enterprise, much less to succeed, all of that kind of ego-bound range of considerations, by definition, disappear. So we might expect and often find with mystics that their view is far from narrow, it's broad. One of the more important Sufis, one of the important Muslim mystics, 
from the late 12th, early 13th century is a fellow by the name of Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi was first known as a very important legalist, a jurist, and uh, wrote extensively on Sharia, on Islamic law. But he gradually becomes more and more engaged beyond that kind of mainstream mode of thinking in the mystical enterprise. And the kind of moment for him is the one he describes in the following words in one of his, um, what's called, it, the translation into English is Bezels of Wisdom. It's Fusus al-Hikam for those of you who are the purists. My heart can take on any form, a meadow for gazelles, a cloister for monks, for the idols, that even means, in other words, the pagans, sacred ground. Kaaba for the circling pilgrim, the tablets of the Torah, the pages of the Quran, my creed is love. Wherever its caravan turns along the way, that is my belief, my faith. So a clear articulation of the recognition that if the one God created a universe that is endlessly multifarious, endlessly diverse, and created a human species within that endlessness, which is similarly endlessly diverse. Look around you, there are no two faces alike. No two of us has exactly the same pigment to our flesh or shape of nose or form of eyes. If there is such extraordinary diversity, then there is inherent logic to a range and diversity of approaches to God and none is in a position, except by way of, I know because it's my ego speaking, to say for sure that mine is the only way. All I can say is that mine is a way for me, but yours may be completely, equally valid, different from mine, as a way for you. It is a paradox. In math, you know, 100% is 100%. But in mysticism, you can have dozens of 100% perfect adding up to 100% perfect instead of adding up to 1,200% or some number of that sort. Ibn Arabi has a younger colleague, and I mean by colleague in the, in, the, in the loose sense of that word. There's no proof whatsoever that these two individuals would have met. They could have, they might have, they might have met in Damascus, but there's absolutely no, no way to know that. This younger figure is a guy by the name of Rumi. Rumi himself, Mevlana Rumi, Jalaladin Rumi, was also someone who started out not only as a jurist, but as someone who was primed to succeed his father, who was a prominent jurist. They left the town of Rumi's birth during the time in the uh, early 13th century of the Mongol invasions. In fact, there's a tradition that Rumi's mother was killed during the Mongol invasion of his town. Whether or not that was so, I don't know. I wasn't there. But they end up eventually from what is now Iran into what is now Turkey, Konya. And along the way, they travel. They go on Hajj. They're down into the Hejaz in the southwestern area of the Arabian Peninsula, the area around Mecca, what, is now, what are now Mecca and Medina. Um, they spend some time in Damascus. He ends up anyway in Konya. And there, while he is essentially, as I said, being primed to succeed his very prominent father as a jurist and has himself started to become a teacher. Imagine this college professor, or maybe it's a law professor would be a better image, talking about legal issues and someone walks in the classroom and raises this question that doesn't really have an easy answer, or perhaps no answer at all. And the professor suddenly stops like that and realizes I've just been misthinking everything that I've been thinking about because I've been thinking in overly limited terms. This is, in effect, in a nutshell, what happens to Rumi when a fellow by the name of Shams of Tabriz shows up at his doorstep. And if Rumi is the teacher and Shams is the student, Shams is the teacher and Rumi is the student. So even the line between who is teaching whom and who is learning from whom becomes eradicated as Rumi thinks and develops his thinking further, part of where he comes to is a mystical place whereby the line between the mystic and God will be eradicated in that the mystic seeks God and the God seeks mystic, the mystic. The mystic is the lover, God is the beloved, love is what joins them, but the line among those three concepts is eradicated because God also seeks the mystic. So God is the lover. 
and the mystic is the beloved. That is one of the ways in which Sufism, beginning with Rabia in the seventh century and in a certain sense culminating with Rumi in the thirteenth century, articulates the mystical process. It is, as Ibn Arabi had said, my creed is love, it is a creed of love. And if I love God, then I must love everything that emanates from God. And what emanates from God is all of creation, including all of humanity. So it shouldn't surprise us if, like Ibn Arabi, Rumi would write, I go into the Muslim mosque and the Jewish synagogue and the Christian church and I see one altar. That shouldn't surprise us. Or if he writes further, not Christian or Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I'm not from the east or the west, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. I do not exist. I am not an entity in this world or the next, did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one, and that one call to and no, first, last, outer, inner, only that breath, breathing, human being. And these rather extraordinary lines are lines that at least from three different angles, it strikes me, offer a lot of food for thought. The first, of course, is what is obvious in the first couple of verses, which has to do with this sensibility that includes every mode of trying to engage God as standing, as it were, on a fundamentally equal footing. Parenthesis. Rumi is emphatically a Muslim. He is not out of that. He is deeply within that, but he understands Islam, the concept of which is submitting to God's will, in universalist terms. He understands the particular Islam, which is his Islam, as, not necess as different, but not superior or inferior to the other Islams, which are called Judaism or Christianity or Hinduism and so on and so forth. Secondly, of course, is the second part of this, where it says, I do not exist. I'm not an entity in this world or the next. Did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. Who is speaking? And one realizes the voice is not Rumi, because that would be a kind of ridiculous thing for Rumi to say of himself. No human would say, I did not descend from Adam and Eve. On the contrary, that's what traditionally humans in this tradition understand to be their point of descent. It is God speaking. And it's not God speaking in the ego-bound, I speak on behalf of God sense. It's in the egoless sense in which the line has been so thoroughly eradicated between Rumi and God that when he speaks, he doesn't even remember when he's speaking, whether he's speaking from himself or from God because they're one and the same. Which leads to the third point, which is what we get at the last couple of lines. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one. He is alluding to that notion of love between himself and God as having so thoroughly unified them that he can't distinguish the one from the other. And that ultimately is the kind of mystical sensibility that informs his thinking in these verses and in so many others. Now think for a moment with me. This is the 13th century, what's going on in the world of which Ibn Arabi and Rumi are part. This is a world which is still, with respect to Christian-Muslim relations, in the throes of the last series <coughs> of crusades and counter-crusades. It's a world in which, on the Christian side of the fence, there is there are all kinds of new developments. Gothic architecture is coming into its own. The scholastic thinkers, people like uh, Thomas Aquinas, are writing their most intense explorations of Christian thought. On the Muslim side of the fence, the world is in great chaos. This is the period when the Abbasid Caliphate is in the process of collapsing in the force of the Mongols who are sweeping from South Central Asia across into the Middle East. 
So between these two worlds and within each of them, there is both creativity and conflict that abounds. And in that context of conflict and creativity, which is for the most part narrowly conceived, people like Ibn Arabi and Rumi explode. They expand to encompass the entire world. They think in universalist terms even as they think of themselves in very specific terms as Muslims, as Sufi Muslims. And Rumi becomes, of course, so caught up in the way in which he thinks that as much as we have his words that articulate his thinking, we also have the tradition that began with him of the ritual of beginning the process of seeking oneness with the mysterion which in Arabic is called dhikr. It's a word that, the root of which means memory. So the idea behind dhikr is that you remember with 150% of yourself God's presence in you and around you. And while the typical dhikr in the various tariqas, in the de different branches or movements within Sufism across time and space are verbal, Rumi gets so excited when he's talking that he starts to jump around. And what ultimately eventuates out of that is a unique dhikr, which involves not words, but movement, body movement. And so his followers, at the drop of a dime, begin to spin. And at the drop of a dime, it can be 10 minutes, it can be an hour, it can be two hours, they stop spinning. Not a moment of dizziness. Because the whole time, their eyes are closed and they are inwardly looking because they're seeing something which is not in this world, but something beyond. Their body position with one hand up and one hand down makes of each of them a kind of bridge between earth and heaven, between the world above and the world below. The sort of thing that Rumi himself says when he says, I have seen the two worlds as one and that one call to and no. First, last, outer, inner, only that breath-breathing human being. These are each of the mystics that follow the Mevlana Tariqa of Sufism. This is extraordinary, extraordinary thinking in an extraordinary time. If we fast forward to our own time and the idea of social movements and their role in peace in the world, and we come in Turkey, the same Turkey where Rumi spent most of his adult life, to a fellow by the name of Fethullah Gülen. Then we come to an individual who, among other things, was very much and heavily influenced uh, at his own, of course, admission by Rumi, by Rumi's thinking and Rumi's writing. Gülen writes that um, those who follow him must be tolerant, embracing, of all of humanity, to have hearts, he writes, wide like the ocean, and to seek to become more perfect beings for, as he writes, the most perfect among human beings are those who are at ease and intimate in the company of other human beings, i.e. all human beings. So he is thinking, you might say, in a very distinctly Aristotelian way, thinking of comfort within the polis, but the polis for Gulen, because he's thinking in a in an Ibn Arabi Rumi way, is the entire world, is all of humanity, and not just Athens, Greece, or Athens, Georgia. He writes, if true Muslims observe these kinds of Quranic principles and go on their way and embrace curses deep in their breasts because they don't tolerate, they don't embrace, because they beat down others, then others will appear in order to implement the justice of destiny to those who cursed us. In the name of dialogue, Gulen Roots writes, we can unite on common ground and shake hands with all. This is because the things that God gives most value to are human beings' love and compassion. So the notion of love and of loving humankind, which is something we recognize as very distinct in Ibn Arabi and Rumi, is something which is very distinct in the writings of Fethullah Gulen. In fact, he's got an essay called Love for Humankind, in which he kind of sums this up. To include, by the way, not only humankind, but the world at large in which humans play a role, an important role, a role that he would say is a role of stewardship 
in looking at the notion that is found in the second uh, chapter of the Quran, beginning in the verse 30, that we are vice regents on the planet. Our job is to act in God's place in continuing to perfect and continuing to create the world. And thus our interest in our environment and our love for humankind, that is our ability to embrace creation, are interwoven. And our interest and love depend on knowing and understanding our own essence, our own ability to discover ourselves and to find a connection, to feel a connection with our creation. He writes, a soul that can sense this depth says, as did Rumi presenting us tales from the language of the heart, and so he quotes Rumi, come, come and join us as we are the people of love devoted to God. Come, come through the door of love and join us and sit with us. Come, let us speak one to another through our hearts. And after quoting Rumi, Gulen finishes up, Islamic thought sees each one of us as a different manifestation of a unique or as different aspects of one reality. So the goal of Gulenesque thinking, the goal is to emulate the sort of thinking that is expressed by any number of individuals over the course of history, but in particular within the Sufi tradition by Ibn Arabi and even more so by Rumi. And the question becomes, what is the method of achieving that goal? How is it that people will be drawn in to social movements that help us make peace in and with the world. And interestingly, but not surprisingly, one of the sources for Gulen's thinking in this respect is Plato. So he's interested in Rumi and he's interested in Ibn Arabi, but he's interested in Aristotle, and he's interested in Plato. He's interested in Einstein, he's interested in Said Nursi, of whom some of you, or at least one of you in this room, knows or knows of. Plato, if you remember The Republic, how many of you have read it? Well, okay. A critical number, if not a critical mass. We'll remember that in Plato's, the beginning point is, is, is the attempt to define what justice is. And, all right, well, maybe we, if we can't quite get to that, let's see if we can figure out how to create just people. Well, maybe we can figure out how to create a just state. And the mechanism that ends up taking us through much of the Republic is, of course, the educational system. The point and purpose, ultimately, is to create a just state with a justly run system run by just individuals who are called guardians, and of course the justice among them, the most just, is what he calls the philosopher king. But the point is, he lays down this educational system in detail, which, by the way, has a lot of flaws. And I would say that Gulen, in emulating Plato by focusing on education, recognizes and steps beyond those flaws. I'll explain what I mean in a moment. But first, just a quote from him with respect to the importance of education. Children form the most active and productive part of a community after every 30 or 40 years. Those who have little children and pay no attention to them should consider how important an element of a people's life they are disregarding, and they should shudder. Whatever is spent for the upbringing of young generations, I think that includes college students, even at UGA in Athens, Georgia, to elevate them to the rank of humanity, to the rank of humanity because you understand that he understands in a very platonic sense that to be human means to be thinking about things. It means not to say, okay, I know what this is, and move on. It's not, okay, I know what democracy is, we've got a democracy, or now we don't have to worry about it anymore. Wrong. You've got to constantly worry about it. To be human, in Plato's terms, is constantly to be exploring and examining and asking definitional questions. It's when you think you know what justice or piety or friendship are that you don't have to ask anymore that you're in trouble. But Gulen adds another layer to that. To be fully human is also to have a full sense of feeling of compassion. That Latin-based word means to feel with, perhaps even of empathy, to feel one with all humans. That's what to be fully human is. So when he says, whatever is spent for the upbringing of young generations to elevate them to the rank of humanity, that's what he means. Thinking, feeling beings will be like an inexhaustible source of income. And what that means in the words that Gulen sp spells out elsewhere, or in a word, is altruism. 
his goal, his intention, his purpose is to try to create out of the young people who are educated by the methods that he lays out in teachings and preachings one after another. And this parenthetically is where I say he goes well beyond Plato because the Platonic Academy, for example, looks down on the arts as an inferior means of training the mind. And in schools that are inspired by Gulen's thinking, those schools include, appreciate, recognize the importance of the arts in furthering how we develop our thinking skills and our skills at compassion. It includes the physical arts. So every Gulen school is filled with sports and not just with brainiacs thinking about technology. It covers a whole range of what reflects the range of what we are as a species and how in various ways we fit into a very varied world. So in talking about trying to produce altruists, the hope for by him uh, of an outcome, as he writes, of love and compassion, but also as a creator of such a sentiment as altruism, an exalted human feeling that in turn generates love, he writes, such an individual holds everyone in high regard and esteem. He is so balanced and faithful to God's will that he will not turn into idols those whom he praises for their services. So by the way, Gula never wants you to be talking about him. That's not his interest. And the teachers who teach in his school don't want you to be talking about them. And when I wrote this book and it was about to be published and I was working with the, with the Tura Press on the final editing of it, and the editor was so helpful and so kind and so compassionate and considerate and I wanted to acknowledge him in the acknowledgments at the beginning, he said, no way, Jose. Well, that was not the exact words. He, but he would not allow me to use his name because it contradicted in an emphatic way the tradition of which he is part, which is to be humble and unassuming, truly altruistic. I do what I do because I should do it. I do it to help others and not just to help myself. So he is so balanced and faithful to God's will that he will not turn into idols those whom he praises for their services. He has to be considerate and fair-minded to everyone who comes to his aid and support the truth. He is moderate and embracing when he has taken wing anew and soared to the summits, so sincere and humble that he will never bring to mind all that he has accomplished. So such an individual, and I've come full circle to a point of my beginning, which was that Turkish word service, hizmet, such an individual will acknowledge the hizmet, the service of others, but in a down-to-earth, matter-of-fact manner. Such an individual expects neither expects nor delivers praise per se because it's like I breathe, so I help others. If such people, Gulen writes, can reflect this duty of service and responsibility in the work and service that they carry out, if they're able to pursue the essence of the fundamental principles of existence and obey orders concerning rules of conduct rather than binding themselves to the consequences of their actions, I'm not worrying about whether I will succeed, I'm doing what I'm doing because I must do it. There is a story that one finds in the Muslim tradition regarding Abraham when he is facing the fires of a fiery furnace and the ant carrying just a little drop of water because the ant is tiny and carries it slowly into the furnace and the comment, commenter to the ant says, what, what, what are you going to do with that little drop of water against these flames? And the ant says, I'm making the first effort to put out those flames. The ant knows the flames won't be put out by that drop of water, but is the energy and the effort to put it out by way of that drop, which is the point. The point is the effort. The point is not to concern yourself about the conclusion, although the uh, hope for outcome, of course, is positive. And again, think of the mystical underpinnings of this. I seek oneness with the mysterio and I may never succeed. I may never succeed, but I keep trying because somehow I believe that I can, even if I believe that it's impossible. It's the effort that counts. Rather than binding themselves to the consequences of their actions, then any unexpected outcome will not cause them to feel defeated, nor will their enthusiasm wane. Instead, 
They will carry out all deeds of service of hismet with a joy of worship, and note that turn of phrase. Hizmet is itself a form of worship, which is why it doesn't matter whether I'm a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or an atheist, if I'm engaged in service for others, that in and of itself constitutes a worship, even if I don't believe that there is a God to worship. And be aware of the gratitude of having reached the apex of true believers. So if I function, to coin a term, in a hismetic manner, then my actions are themselves carry me to what he calls the apex of true believers, even if I'm not a believer at all, in what he happens to believe in, which is the one God, and God's relationship with and love of us. An apex which is considered to be the highest level of existence. Such people rush forward feeling the intense flavor hidden in the essence of the deed, saying an echo of Rumi, and so Gulen quotes Rumi yet again, I have become a slave. I have become a slave, I have become a slave. Slaves are happy when they are set free, but I am honored and happy to become a slave. And of course, by slave, he means to transform the concept in a hismet manner, so that what it means to, do, to be is to be someone who is enslaved to the love of God and as a consequence, the love of humanity, and as a consequence, is altruistic, and as a consequence, is engaged in actions that are service to others. It is very much to be engaged in a social movement, the point and purpose ultimately of which is to be at peace, to making peace in and with the world, to improving the world to the point where it becomes a place of peace. In the end, then, what Gulen repeatedly does is to fall back on these sources of inspiration that point him to repeated articulations of the importance of acting on behalf of others, of understanding the word others to constitute all of humanity, indeed all of the planet, not just humans, animals, trees, flowers, rocks, all of it, and if, as in his case, it's because you recognize that all of this ultimately comes from God, fine. And if you don't believe that God exists, but you're still engaged in that, also fine. Come, quoting Rumi as he does, come, come wherever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Come, come and join us, as we are the people of love devoted to God. Come, come through the door of love and join us and sit with us. Come, let us speak one to another through our hearts. Let us speak secretly, without ears and eyes. Let us laugh together without lips or sound. Let us laugh like the roses, like thought. Let us see each other without any words or sounds. Since all are the same, let us call each other from our hearts. We won't use our lips or tongue. The language doesn't matter. The words don't matter. The particularities of your address of the other or no address of the other don't matter. As our hands are clasped together, let us talk about it. Or, as Rumi again and again says, Gulen says, become the light. Those three words, become the light, are what he promotes as a means of hismet, as an instrumentation for a social movement that engages the world toward its peace. In the end, Gulen writes, he, Rumi, promises that as we come to fully recognize that goodness, beauty, truthfulness, and being virtuous lie in the essence of the world, then whatever happens, the world will one day find the essence and no one will be able to prevent the shining of the light, the leading of the world toward peace and perfection from happening. And I open the floor to questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Or do you all have all the answers already? <laughs> yes, sir. Welcome to the UCA. Thank you very, very much for inspiring and helping this talk. What do you consider Sufi brotherhood to be social movements? One. Two, is the Hizmat movement sort of a de facto Sufi order in the world? without the name of a Sufi order? And third question, and this is basically to play... Devil's advocate? 
Is Al Qaeda also a social movement? Okay. Um, I'll take them in order, and usually when that happens, I do it in reverse order, but I'll take it in order. Um, so I would say that, that the Sufi brotherhoods are clearly social movements, both, you know, in the broadest sense, in the vaguest sense, but also when you consider that by and large, your membership in a Sufi brotherhood is not a monastic membership. In other words, you don't organize yourselves into a brotherhood that lives away from the world, but you are expected to be living within the world. You're likely to be married, you're likely to have a family. You, re you withdraw periodically to be part of this meditative process of seeking oneness with the one, to use my, my little phrase. But the intention, therefore, by definition, is to be in the world, and by definition, there can be no purpose to your purpose as part of the brotherhood unless it's to go and come back and be part of improving the world. So I would say, de facto, the Sufi brotherhoods are by and large um, social movements. Second, with respect to the Hizmet movement, um, which is emphatically a social movement, of course, its Sufi underpinnings are present to those who have studied Gulen and his thinking and his writing and seen how he is motivated to write and speak about what he writes and speaks about to inspire the increasingly far-flung members of what we loosely call the Hizmet movement. And clearly, Sufism is a, an underpinning for him. So to that extent, it's fair to say there's a way in which the Hizmet movement could be considered a Sufi movement. On the other hand, because he is so emphatically universalist, and therefore includes among those who can be part of Hizmet, not only members of other religious denominations, but atheists as well. So you don't want to go too far in narrowly calling it a Sufi movement because that implies you know, a, a kind of particularized way of thinking and it's probably broader than that. And as for Al-Qaeda, uh, part of Al-Qaeda is distinctly social. Part of um, our failure to engage Al-Qaeda is not the engaging of Al-Qaeda, it's providing the quid quo, pro to their quo to the extent that they do social action in the communities in which they become involved. Now that social action may ultimately uh, be either a mask or a balance to other actions which are hardly socially positive and hardly geared toward making peace in and with the world. But there is a component of Al-Qaeda, which is clearly a social movement which exists to improve the lives in bits and pieces in parts of the world where they are active. Um, it is too unfortunately interwoven with other issues. Um, and perhaps that's symptomatic of the way in which too often over history, which is to say all of human history, religion and politics get interwoven with each other. And so where Al-Qaeda is concerned, part of what mis or misdirects them from being, in the purer sense, a social movement is the ego-bound political side of what their leadership can be, has been, is, that can lead as easily in a destructive as in a creative kind of direction. Sure, you're more than welcome. We're done then. Yes? <laughs> There's always one troublemaker sure. in every crowd. No, Go ahead. I'm sort of in the, the band. Sort of. Good. How do you see what's happened to the Hizmet movement now in Turkey? Was there a misstep getting too close to the political parties? Was there what is, what, do, do you have a take? On I wish I could claim that I planted him in the audience because <laughs> it was the right question to ask. I didn't plant him, however. Um, uh, yes, I do have a take, okay? Um, this may be a slightly long-winded answer, so forgive me those of you who hate long wind, and I've already been long-winded. When Mr. Erdogan ran for the first time almost, what, 12 years ago or so to be prime minister, he had the support of Fethullah Gulen, I think, in a personal way, and therefore the Hizmet movement broadly, which parenthetically, it's not, it's, um, it's not a monolith. 
You know, it's not Gulen says do this and then everyone who is affiliated with the movement says, yes, we do this. There is much more flexibility a a across the various elements within the Hizmet world, end of parenthesis. But anyway, Gulen's view at the time, and if you look at Turkey at the time, it had been through a succession of really lameish kind of governments, both in a more secularist and in a more Islamist direction, and it's, Turkey was going nowhere fast. Erdogan had been tremendously successful as mayor of Istanbul, had done a lot of important improvements in all kinds of ways in the infrastructure of, of Istanbul, um, both in the way that you would see in the streets, you know, superficially, but also in the, in the recesses of how Istanbul was functioning. And he seemed to be um, a kind of breath of fresh air. And so Gulen certainly gave his support for that. Moreover, Erdogan seemed to be on the same page as Gulen in being simultaneously a devout Muslim, but also someone with a wider view, not an Islamist view in the narrow, ugly sense that that word has come to be used in. I shouldn't have left a preposition at the end, forgive me. Over the course of the, I would say, the first uh, term and a half, maybe I'll be more generous, the first two terms of Erdogan, that kind of scenario seemed to be playing itself out. And Turkey found itself in all kinds of ways, both internally and externally, on new territory. I mean, economically becoming gigantic uh, in all sorts of ways. I mean, things you wouldn't even think about. The Turks outproduced the Italians uh, with, with regard to olives, for example. Who thinks about that? But that's just a small example. Dozens of those kinds of examples. And also in terms of its role in the Middle East, which in case nobody noticed, is a rather problematic region within the world. And it's a region within which historically the Turkish relationship to the, both the Persian or Iran, Iranian and the Arab world had not been an overly comfortable one. And uh, Erdogan seemed very effectively to be pushing Turkey into a place where he could really be a champion of the Islamic world regardless of whether its identity is Sunni or Shi, regardless of whether its ethnic identity is Arab or Persian or Turkish. Um, and then things began to fall apart. And things began to fall apart, in part it would seem, because as Mr. Jefferson once said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I mean. I'm not there, right? I'm not in there. But it seems that Erdogan began to take a distinct turn away from the kind of principles that I've just very briefly outlined uh, for which Gulen stands and Gulen's vision of what it means to be a Muslim. Uh, and you can see that beginning most obviously with the whole incident that involved the Gaza flotilla and you can see that in subsequent developments jumping fast forward to Erdogan's failure to succeed with respect to Assad and how he was handling the rebels. Two Ramadans back, Erdogan calls Assad shortly before. He says, it's about to be Ramadan. Why don't you lay off the bombing, at least for the holy month of Ramadan? On the contrary, Assad picked up the pace of bombing. In Egypt, where he hoped to have a kind of mediating influence on the complications following the so-called Arab Spring. Again, very little results. The unfinalized relationship with the Europeans with respect to EU membership and all of that connotes. And then the culmination, of course, what, six, seven months ago, Gezi Park, and everything that has followed therefrom. So Erdogan's position, it seems to me, first of all, has at a practical political level, both internally and externally, been in a way slowly disintegrating over the last four or five years. And the primary source of that disintegration seems to me to be himself. Okay? Now in that context, he has, he and Gulen have had a very distinct parting of the ways. Gulen still supported him in the last, the third of his prime ministerial elections, as I understand it that Gulen said, look, as, as long as you are still the, the best candidate, I, I, I am going to support you. Um, nor, by the way, is it clear in, in demographic sense what that support means. You know, how many votes does he get or not get because Gulen says 
thumbs up or thumbs down. I don't know. But in the last six months, in looking for a way out of a predicament that after the Gezi Park mess was followed just a few months later by the corruption scandal, right, which just hit a new level yesterday, in looking for like a caged rat, uh, sorry, a cornered rat, how to punch out of that corner, he has looked at the Hizmet movement and pointed the figure at the Hizmet movement. They're running a parallel government. They're doing this, they're doing that. I was in Turkey in January and the Hizmet people, there are they're all kinds of jokes about, oh my God, the, the light switch is broken. Ugh. It's the Hizmet people. Oh, the toilet stuffed. Ah, it's the Hizmet people. I mean, that's the dark humor within the Hizmet movement because he has been pointing a finger in that direction in order to redirect any focus from the government and its levels of corruption, except that that has now shown up as of yesterday at his own doorstep in, in the, the form of a recorded conversation between him and his son which shows that the corruption issue is not just this minister or that minister, but in himself. So, it's not that Gulen either went too far or went in the wrong direction. There was a very logical logic to his support of Erdogan initially and perhaps even as late as the third election cycle. But things have gone in such an ugly direction, particularly in the last six months, not because of Gulen, who sticks to his guns, and I mean, that's the wrong metaphor, because one of the things that, that the Erdogan people would dearly love is if followers of Gulen would take the streets in violent protests, because then they could, violence would ensue and he could restore order, right? But they won't do that, that's not the style that Gulen teaches or preaches. It's not about violence. It is about peace. It is about staying within the, the bounds of the legal system. If things need to be changed, they need to be changed from within the system which has been struggling to shape itself since the post um, Ataturk era as a true democracy and which cannot be contravened unless chaos is to ensue. And so it's a kind of a double frustration, I think. If you ask my opinion, this is from where I stand, for Erdogan, that he, he's trying to finger the Hizmet people and they're not rising to the bait and he's tried to make it as miserable as he can, switching police officers, their families moving twice in a week from this jurisdiction to that to that, removing judges from their appointed positions, prosecutors from theirs, because that he has the power to do and trying to use the bully pulpit as the prime minister so that the Turks overall will think, okay, you know, he must be telling it like it is, so what's wrong with these Hizmet people? But you know, that is starting slowly to backfire. People who were either suspicious of or altogether hostile to Gulen are more and more starting to see that he's about what's real and w what the Prime Minister is about is, as I said, a cornered rat desperation. And, to, to date, the culmination is, as I said, what, what was revealed yesterday. Um, and we'll see where it goes from here. There are elections coming up locally in March and federally a few months later, and we'll see where things go. Long-winded answer. I said it would be long-winded to your question. Yes, ma'am. I think the answer is, is religious leaders who are people of vision and political leaders who are people of vision. There aren't a lot of those running around the world right now and certainly around the region. I do see Gulen as that kind of, of, of a figure, but he's only one and you need more than one. Um, and because within the Middle East, the issue of religion is so complicated and has always been interwoven with the religion of the issue of politics, which is so complicated, and the issue of ethnicity, and the issue of tribalism, and the issue of national nationality, and the issue of economics, and in turn, those different issues have been interwoven with the problem of definition, 
how do you, there are all these terms that get used that people don't think about what they actually mean. I mean, in this country, if I asked you 10 or 12 years ago, well, before 9-11, what's the difference between a Muslim and an Arab, most people would not think that there was one. They would assume those were synonyms. Well, I think by now most Americans realize that you have Arabs that are Muslim, Arabs that are Christian, right? And you have Muslims that are not Arab. But as recently as a decade ago, most Americans wouldn't have realized that. And I, think, I don't think Americans are the only group that wouldn't have. You've got a whole range of definitional issues. You've got a whole range of contending aspirational issues, both historically and contemporary in the contemporary scene, and historically and now, you have a range of different kinds of interferences. If you look at Syria, first of all, think of where Syria is geographically. So by definition, what's happening in Syria cannot not affect Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, if it even exists any longer, Jordan, Israel. That's just the immediate neighborhood. If you look internally to what's going on, the Saudis are involved, the Iranians are involved from the outside, and there was a lot of push for the Americans to be involved in a way analogous to how we were involved in Iraq a while back, and still I suppose are. So, and that's just Syria, and I just gave you the tip of the iceberg. I'm not even going into the ethnic and the religious kind of subdivisions within the rebel camp as opposed to the rebels versus Assad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So not to be dark about this, but there is no simple solution. Um, the more people think about, are educated to, and try and understand, and I mean both there and outside of the region, about others and not just about themselves, the more there are leaders who promote that kind of ideology, the closer one comes to the hope for some sort of a resolution. But um, don't expect it to be soon, alas. Was there another question? Yes, sir. Is it flawed to pursue the meaningful life according to positive psychology because the meaningful life is the most fulfilling for the individual? Like, if I'm trying to live a meaningful life, it's the most fulfilling to me. Is it flawed to live it for that reason as opposed to living it just to help others? Like you said, like I breathe, so I help others. Because if I already know that um, it's going to be the most beneficial to me, it's hard to block that out. Right. I believe it is. And it would be probably more than human if you could so successfully all the time do that. Um, where is the line drawn in the simplest of senses between myself and the other when it really makes me feel good to help the other? I have no tangible benefit to me, but it does make me feel good. So I can't completely disconnect myself, but I can place myself in the context of placing more emphasis on the other, whatever and whoever the other is. Think of your parents who, when you were a kid, they don't do it anymore, I hope, but they made your breakfast and they made your lunch and they made sure you got to school and your, your mom or your dad was so tired in the morning and got up and made sure you were uh, out of bed and made you that lunch and made you that breakfast and got you off there to school and it was entirely, and you never said thank you, and you didn't, you know, you didn't really appreciate it. I don't mean necessarily you, but you know what I mean. And your mother or your father loved doing it because they loved you, and it just made them feel good. So I can't say it's entirely selfless because it made them feel good. But still, the emphasis was on you, not on them. So if that answers your question. Yes? Okay. Uh, is, this a, is this twin, twin? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, They criticize that the Gulen movement has kind of circumvented the political process in Turkey and in its following, you know, by being solely kind of in the educational sphere and mm -hmm. controlling all those prep schools. And it's kind of unfortunate that within the political sphere in Turkey, there isn't like a huge, a very compelling response to that. Okay, okay. Like the different, you know. Right, the opposition parties are very weak. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, so I guess, do you think that? Not that whether that was wrong of Warren to structure his movement that way, but do you think that he 
actually, I think my question is, do you think that a movement like the lens, or a movement like these altruistic social movements could could exist and gain traction through something like the political process, which I feel like centers around something that's very anti everything we talk about, right. like aggrandization right. of itself and gaining support for this figure, as it has for Erdogan, and it's worked well for him. Right. Let me answer that, because that was really two parts in reverse. Um, to step into the political arena um, is to engage in the danger of becoming corrupted by it. It's very difficult to be in the political arena and not in some way, shape, or form be corrupted. Um, and part of the point and purpose of social movements like the Hizmet movement, it's not the only one, there, there are others as well who try to improve the world without being part of the political process. Um, and I, I think that's, that's still desirable because of what I just said. To become part of the political process puts you in all kinds of danger with respect to your principles. To come back to the first, more important question, however, um, I wouldn't say that, that Gulen circumvented the political process. It's rather that out of his principles, he created a series of ideas that inspired an ever-expanding love from his followers that are an ever-expanding group that understood the principles, again, I was just reading the, the, the tip of the iceberg, who saw education as a means of creating a hizmet movement which would improve the world. The intention, I don't believe, was to be outside the political movement, it was to be non-political. Um, and as a matter of fact, also to be non-Islamic in the narrow sense of that term. So the Hizmet schools don't teach Islam. The faculty tend to be from the movement, most of whom tend to be, but not all of them, Muslim. And there are certainly among the students who are inspired by the faculty, those who maybe didn't start out in particularly, I mean Muslims who were very secular, who become inspired to be more spiritual. There are also non-Muslims in those schools who don't become Muslim. There are non-Muslims who probably do as well, but the, the schools follow very carefully the prescriptions of the law in Turkey which remains opposed to Islamic teaching, uh, sorry, to religious teaching within the school system. They're private schools, but they follow the, the dictates of what is in the public sphere. So it then becomes a matter of perspective. Now, if I'm going to criticize Gulen for whatever reasons, because I'm a secular Muslim who fears that he's too much of an Islamist, or because I'm an Islamist who fears that he's too engaged with these other religious traditions and therefore not purely enough Muslim, or if I'm Erdogan who is looking for a scapegoat for my own failings, what are my options as far as modes and means of criticizing? Well, I certainly could say, look, he's created this system of schools, the point and purpose of which is to um, uh, propagate his teachings, indoctrinate, brainwash, etc., etc., etc. All I can say is, from the schools that I visited, both there in Turkey, uh, actually in Tbilisi, Georgia, and a number of them here in the United States, unless they're all studying with the same acting teacher, right? Um, so as to practice the most extraordinary level of takia that has ever been known to humankind, which is a mode of deception, then that's not what it's about. So it's not circumventing the political movement. It's trying to improve the world without recourse to politics, per se. Okay? And you had a question? Yeah, okay, so I'm a, I guess like, I'm a little bit troubled about what you mentioned about like this paternalistic relationship that this, so like what you, in response to this question, you said that like, well, back 10 years ago when my parents were taking care of me, they, ah. they were doing so, um, like on my behalf or whatever, and that's, is that, I, am I mistaking that to say that like this is what 
this sort of so new social movement is trying to replicate that? Yes, you are, you are mistaking it. Okay. Uh, what, what, what I meant by that simply was the notion of how a parent loves his or her child and will do things without even thinking about it for the child that doesn't give the parent particular benefit other than the satisfaction, right, of seeing my child well fed, of seeing my child happy. I just meant it as a kind of analogy. No, the intention is not to be paternalistic. The intention is not to replicate the parent acting down toward my six-year-old child at all. Okay. okay. Thank but thank you for asking the question. Ma'am, did you have a question? Um, yes. Uh, just uh, according to the pattern recently in Ukraine and Kiev, and the riot came from the joint EU or not, the government. Mm -hmm. And I know Turkey also in the position, and the uh, EU country have to make a decision allow Turkey enter into mm -hmm. EU or not. But do you foresee this social movement eventually will broke, break out into a riot against the EU countries? Um, you've left out a very important factor, which is that behind what's happening in Ukraine is a gentleman by the name of Vladimir Putin. And he cannot be excluded. And parenthetically, I think that Mr. Erdogan sees himself as a mini Putin. And his ambition is to accomplish what Putin has, which is essentially to bring back a Stalinist era in which he is in charge regardless of whether the hat he wears says president or prime minister. And trust me, that the riots that have been going on in Kiev are in part a function of the Russian discomfort with the Ukrainian desire to be more associated with the EU. There are problems, if you think further back, to the transfer of oil from Russia to Europe through Ukraine, where when Ukraine sought a little bit more of an independent stature, in that regard, the Russians simply cut off the oil, which meant both Ukraine was kind of now without an important source of transit income and the Western Europe was without an important source of oil. So the picture there cannot leave Russia out. Whereas where what is happening in Turkey is concerned, there isn't an outside force of that weight that has the kind of presence or potential power, at least as things stand now, th that makes it comparable to Ukraine. Aside from that, the, the government of Erdogan, and I don't, don't remember whether I said this because I spoke earlier in Atlanta today, so I may have sent it there, said it there and not here. The government of Erdogan would very much like a take to the streets. I did say it here, didn't I, a few moments back? Um, action on the part of the followers of Yulen because it would precipitate, it could precipitate that kind of violence and response. But that's very unlikely, I think, to happen. So ultimately, the violence that characterizes Ukraine in the last month is not likely to eventuate in Turkey. At least I hope not. And for the time being, the whole question of, of, of the relationship to the EU, I think, has been shelved anyway because of other concerns, both internal and external, with respect to the region. So it's almost moot at this point, if that answers your question. Yeah, another question is about Turkish and Kurdish. Yes. Do you see this uh, Islamic or Muslim religion have a way to deal with them. I know right now under the government, they are equal. Right. But the title is not in that way. It, I think it takes, it takes time to undo something that has been done wrong for a long time. I think one of the, one of the credits I would give to Erdogan is his turning the Kurdish issue within Turkey around and trying to, um, to accede to the, the demands that the Kurds have had since World War I, since there was a Turkey as we understand it, to have a certain degree of 
cultural autonomy, if not political. And um, that's one area where I think he has operated fairly well. Now, part of that is practical, because the Kurds aren't only in Turkey, they're in Syria, they're in Iraq, and Iraq is the, in the, the Kurdish-held areas of Iraq is where most of the oil is. And Turkey is now in a position where it needs a relationship with that part of Iraq for the purposes of oil, which means it needs a relationship with Iraqi Kurds, which means it behooves Turkey to have a better relationship with its own Kurdish population. So there are practical reasons and not just um, ideological or altruistic reasons for that. But for the moment, that seems to be both on an even keel and, if anything, moving forward in a positive way. There's no reason why it can't under the right sort of leadership. Well, thank you all very, very much. Um, so we will have a book signing session now, if you would like to uh, get a book of Dr. Soltes. Thank you. It's the right time. Thank you.